reposting a podcast interview that I did with Evan Pycon from Training Think Tank from my own eponymous podcast feed on the Legion feed because Evan is deep in the weeds with uh, some in-house testing related to blood flow in and out of muscles and oxygen saturation and all these biological variables that actually impact performance in CrossFit. And I think that his framework for thinking about this stuff is is a game changer, right? A lot of these concepts have been around for a while, but the way that he explains it and some of the stuff that he's done seems to really explain a lot of the unexplainable things that we see in athletes who are trying to compete in CrossFit. People who have fantastic cyclical scores on 2K rows and huge sets of unbroken muscle ups, but they finish terribly in the open when they have to do a bunch of burpee box jump overs and dumbbell snatches. And then on the flip side of that, people who just seem to never get tired and you can load them up with a ton of weight and they can just do set after set of back squats at pretty high percentages of their one rep max, but they never actually seem to get stronger. And and Evan actually has some frameworks for thinking about this stuff that I think can completely revolutionize the way that we are actually programming uh, and training athletes to get them better at the sport that they're working on. So this is a little bit in the weeds, but I think this audience will hopefully appreciate that. So enjoy. Oh yeah, I always get like this band versus this band or like this album versus that album and weird stuff like that. Or sometimes people will just be like, what's the most recent thing you've listened to? And I'm like, I don't fucking know. <laughs> what um, what was the most recent album versus album question? I think the most recent one, it was because I was wearing a Norma Jean t-shirt in a video that TTT yeah. posted and someone had asked me about... I think they'd asked me about like Josh Scoggin, Norma Jean versus Corey Brandon. What's your opinion? I think I'm going to have to go Josh Scoggin. Great. Is, which is the guy who left to form the chariot? That's, yeah, that's Josh. Okay, cool. So you prefer the, the earlier Norma Jean? Yeah, it's weird. I prefer the sound of the earlier records, but my favorite album is the Redeemer album which isn't with that vocalist. So I don't know. Sounds like a complicated opinion. Yeah, it's very complex and nuanced. <laughs> I'm a very deep thinker and a deep man. <laughs> very deep thinker regarding metalcore. Yeah. Um, CTP is also a metalcore man, it seems, yeah? Yeah, CTP likes a lot of that music too. And then our manual therapist, actually, I used to live with him, but he's really into hardcore and metalcore music too. Oh yeah, you can tell he's alt. I saw him... Um, at the whatever the Florida regional was a few years ago. And I was like, this guy clearly is into alternative music. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the um what's the what's the consensus music choice amongst you guys then? Are you guys like going to going to shows and spin kicking ninjas? I don't CTP's actually never gone to a show with us, but Tony and I have seen a few different shows together. Um we actually went to Under Oath like a year ago, which was kind of fun because everyone there was 14 years old. <laughs> I felt like when I was a kid and I was at those shows and be like, oh, those are like the cool older people, and I'm like, I don't feel cool right now. I just feel <laughs> yeah. weird with a bunch of kids here. Um so that was neat. I think the uh, I think an interesting aspect of that as well is like, you know, the band is obviously getting older, but the fans are sort of saying the same age, which that has to feel weird, too. That's the weird things. You'd think that you're like, oh, under if they were big when I was like 12 years old, everyone there is going to be close to 30 and everyone there was still 12 to 14 years old. And I just felt weird. So that was interesting. We also, um, I saw Norma Jean in Atlanta about a year ago, which they're an Atlanta band. So that was kind of cool. Is that really why you moved to Atlanta? That's exactly why I moved to Atlanta. Yeah. You're like, how can I, how can I get closer? Destroyed my hometown venue in New York and got it shut down permanently. So I had to be a refugee and come to the South. Is that actually a thing? I oh, know that that was like a legit thing that happened. There's this it was like one of the sketchy Long Island bars that all the shows were at. And at one of the shows, the singer of Norma Jean just stopped the set and he just decided to yell. Everything that's not bolted to the ground is going in the air. And everyone started throwing bar stools and someone threw a bar stool through the front glass window. And that got the venue permanently shut down. And we didn't have any good shows for about a year and a half after that. <laughs> That's incredible. 
there was um not not quite the same level of destruction in Chicago, but you know, a variety of venues stopped hosting like punk hardcore and metal shows for fights, you know, various crews, you know, beating each other up and moshing and kids stage diving and breaking limbs, like all this stuff that tends to happen. And there was a festival and I don't really remember what the situation was. It wasn't like incited by any of the bands or anything, but someone ended up like kicking a hole through a wall. <laughs> and this is sort of like, you know, a, 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 a pivotal moment in Chicago hardcore. <laughs> Some guy sees this happen and just in like pure dismay, hands on his head. He goes, not another venue. <laughs> and I do think that that venue did stop doing hardcore shows at that point. So yeah, I was going to say, I feel like the shelf life of venues for that kind of music is so small. So I feel like the, like, I don't know if this is just in like an Atlanta thing or a Long Island thing, the two places that I've just happened to live, but I don't think there's any small local venues around the Atlanta area. We have like two pretty big venues with pretty tight security, but there's nothing like the kinds of shows that I used to go to back in the day. Yeah. I wonder if it's like a, a difficult business model, and if there was some reason that it used to be able to exist and just can't anymore. I don't know. I mean, it also might just be people don't really go to shows in the same way that they used to. Like, I know even myself, I only go to a show if there's multiple bands on a card that I want to see. Where back in the day, we just used to go to shows that we didn't even know the bands. Like, you would yeah. just go because that's where people were. And we didn't really have social media aside from MySpace. I wonder if the the younger population doesn't do that. Right. Could, could that be a change where, you know, several years ago that was sort of like the standard behavior and then the next generation of music fans doesn't do that. So there's not that just like constant flow of people supporting underground music. Yeah. I mean, it's probably that. And also just like there's way more stuff to do in most areas these days where like, Back when I used to go to a lot of underground music shows, it's like we skateboarded and we went to shows and that's the only things that we did on weekends. Where now it's like, I can't imagine most kids want to just go to like a venue that probably smells they're getting kicked in the face. And <laughs> the, uh, the opportunity cost now of going to a show though is, is higher too, not just because there's other stuff to do, but there's stuff to do at home. Right, where you have Netflix and Snapchat and Instagram or whatever. So you're not sort of in that same state of just like searching for entertainment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, for someone who just wants to like casually go to a show and put on their social media too, like it's probably not the place to go to because you're probably going to get punched in the teeth at some point and you're probably going to end up in a pit at some point. So it's also not like the most friendly thing for people to get into. Yeah, it's really interesting. I'd be curious to see. I want some data. I want yeah, maybe some we could do like a statistical analysis on this, and we could we could make this legit. I think that I think that tracking down the data on uh, you know underground punk show attendance is probably a challenging thing. I mean, there with, with it within Chicago as well. I mean, I, I feel there's ebbs and flows in terms of the number of just like basement shows too. You know that at some points there's a lot of venues doing things like that and then all the venues get shut down or the people move out and then like another crop eventually pops up but yeah that's an interesting thought yeah at one point uh ctp and i actually had this awesome idea talking about like bands related analytics where i had this idea that i wanted to start doing physiological testing for drummers in different hardcore and metal bands I oh, yeah, yeah. thought of this whole like kind of model behind it and Slipknot was they were literally playing on the block that Training Thing Tank is on because we have the I think it's the Verizon Amphitheater on the same road. And we were talking about this whole thing, how we were going to get moxie testing done on Slipknot's drummer. And obviously it never happened, but I still have that idea in my head. And I think that'd be pretty sweet. I would love to see what is happening in someone like that's forearms for sure. Like what in the world is going on there? I mean, just think of the amount of sheer blood flow going through their forms and how much of a limitation CrossFit athletes have with grip. Like that might be the best way to train grip endurance in CrossFit athletes. That's a good point, right? Because it's it's that just like, well, 
what, what do you think would be the difference between, um, sort of like the, the grip endurance of like actually having to hold versus like, I mean, drumming, you're essentially just flicking the whole time. Yeah. I mean, I'm also being like kind of tongue in cheek, like (laughs) (laughs) honestly, it's probably a terrible use of their time if anything, but I think it'd be cool if people started doing that. And then I could say that I'm the one that started that trend in CrossFit because I haven't really been like a trendsetter with anything. The p- things that I generally am into aren't really that sexy or cool to talk about. So I do think that that idea is like just stupid enough that it could take off. Right. Um, there, there was a, it probably still is a thing. It's like a, a fitness, a fitness class based upon drumming. I think it was called pound, right? So you'd like hold like a hollow and be like <laughs> pounding the ground with drumsticks. <sighs> we we shared a space with some folks who, who would occasionally do pound classes a few years ago at South Loop Strength and Conditioning. It was foolish. <laughs> um, so, I mean, we talked a little bit about the Moxie a second ago. Um, and you have been putting stuff out there about this for a while with some really interesting ideas about blood flow and oxygen saturation in the muscle and all that kind of stuff. So I have a bunch of questions for you that are kind of in the weeds on that. But I think before I start asking you those questions, it would probably be relevant to just give a, a basic background on like the, the physiology of oxygen delivery in athletes and then just what actually happens with the MOXIE and like other comparable units. Right. So... The way that I'd probably explain this is just a going over the basic path, how oxygen gets from the environment into our working muscles. So obviously we breathe in air, air is going to go into the lungs and diffuse into the blood of the alveoli. And then the heart's going to pump that blood to the working muscle. And then that oxygen is going to be bound to the hemoglobin. And then it's eventually going to end up in the mitochondria in the muscle tissue. What Moxie is looking at is that last step. It's using infrared light and it's shooting the signal into the muscle tissue and the capillary bed and it's looking at how much oxygen is actually showing up there in the working muscle and it when you go to the doctor and they put the little thing on your finger that measures your oxygen saturation how does that compare to what's happening with the moxie yes so a pulse oximeter is the one that they're going to use on your finger so what a pulse oximeter was looking at it's also looking at oxygen saturation but that's at the level of the artery So that's systemic oxygen saturation. That's going to tell you what's flowing through your arteries and what your brain and your heart and your vital organs are getting. What a NEARS device like Moxie is going to tell you is what the oxygen saturation is inside the capillary beds in the muscle. So it's a more superficial penetration of light. Got it. So it's a similar device, but just a slightly different um, focus and application. And when you say NIRS, that's N-I-R-S, which is near infrared spectroscopy. Is that correct? Okay, cool. Yeah, so essentially it's shining a light, and then based upon how that light refracts, you're able to make some assumptions or calculations about what is actually being carried in the blood. Is that a good way of explaining that? Yeah, exactly. So it's basically hemoglobin when it's bound to oxygen versus when it's not bound to oxygen. When you shoot a laser at it, it's going to absorb a different spectrum of light and refract a different spectrum of light. So the sensor is basically shooting that laser into the muscle. Then it's picking it back up with the sensor and it's using that to determine how much of the hemoglobin in your blood is actually bound to oxygen. Got it. Right on. And so if we think about, I mean, you you mentioned just like the overall pathway of oxygen delivery, right? That people have some vague sense if they're an athlete, um, particularly within like CrossFit or mixed modal sports, that they should be doing something to work on their aerobic capacity, right? And they might have some idea that VO2 max has something to do with that, but it might be a little bit fuzzy, right? And, and I think what you're saying is that within CrossFit in particular, the actual way that oxygen is delivered um, to the muscle is potentially more applicable to how athletes perform than just like the overall, you know, VO2 max of a person. So can you give like a a breakdown of how VO2 max might relate to someone taking oxygen and what you think is actually happening in a lot of CrossFit athletes? Yes. So the way that I think about VO2 max is a VO2 max isn't, it is a physiological testing variable, but it's not actually a physiologic measurement. Like there's nothing 
called a VO2 in your body, it's a product of a certain testing parameter. So if you tweak the test setup, you have a different VO2 max. So VO2 is just looking at the total oxygen consumption in your body with and that's kind of a proxy that we're using for performance. So this is a really imperfect analogy. I actually thought of this when I was walking my dog yesterday because he pants for everything because he's a husky in the South. So if you think about, we go outside, me and my dog, if it's really cold out, he starts shivering. And if it's less cold, he shivers less. And at some point he's going to start panting as it gets hotter and the hotter it gets, the more my dog is going to pant my dog's rate of panting correlates with the actual temperature outside. So if we were to map it out, if we didn't know what temperature was and we didn't have Fahrenheit or Celsius, I could go outside and say, like, look at his rate of panting over a minute and say, oh, it is eight pant units outside <laughs> right now. And that would tell me how hot it is. And it's useful because that's valid and repeatable, but we're not actually taking a direct measurement of temperature. So if you were to actually measure that, that's a more useful measurement. And that's kind of how I think about something like VO2 or heart rate. They correlate tightly. And the point of doing a VO2 max test or tracking heart rate during a test is to get an idea of how the cardiopulmonary system is operating in live time. And the purpose of the cardiopulmonary system is to get oxygen to the working muscle where it's consumed. So the reason that I like NEARS is it's kind of like taking the temperature where using something like heart rate tracking or VO2 testing is kind of like using my dog panting scale. It gives us a really good proxy and an understanding of something, but we could also just go and take that measurement directly and skip that entire proxy step altogether. Yeah, you're basically just getting closer to the actual spot that the oxygen is being utilized by using the, the MOXIE or a similar device rather than up a few layers, which then, you know, reduces the actual like specific applicability of the measurement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So within an athlete who is potentially fatiguing, um, what is, what is typically happening to them at the muscular level that you're able to, to measure, right? Like what's happening with their oxygen utilization and what are you, what are you learning based upon your current measurements? So one of the main things that we're finding is depending on what athletes we're working with, there's going to be different roadblocks from how that oxygen and blood is going to get to the working muscle and then how quickly they could utilize it. So what we're trying to do is a look at the total rate of blood and oxygen delivery to the muscle and then look at that rate of utilization and then figure out what is preventing someone from either delivering more blood and oxygen to the muscle or utilizing it quicker in the muscle. And for Every athlete, it's going to be some combination of the two of those that's creating their limitation in the sport. So essentially, the the limiting factor is going to be the ability of the muscle to utilize oxygen at some point. Is that is that going to always be the case? Yes. Yeah, so the a utilization limitation, if we're talking about like highly trained athletes, it's probably not going to be an issue in most cases. I really only see that. If we have someone who's a novice or an early stage intermediate, or if someone's coming off of an injury or layoff from training, just because someone doing like a good bit of hard training, like a CrossFit athlete, probably won't encounter that type of limitation just based on the adaptations that they're getting from the sport. Sure. So if the, if the oxygen is there in a well-trained athlete, then they're probably going to be able to utilize it. Yeah, if they get it to the working muscle, they'll be able, they'll usually be able to utilize it. And then if we were to like really get extreme, like if you took a CrossFit athlete and you wanted them to become a 100 meter sprinter, they'll probably be limited by their rate of oxygen utilization. But for anything that they're going to have to do within the sport of CrossFit, it's probably not going to be an issue for them. Interesting. So with 100 meters, people would typically think of that as like an anaerobic type of situation, right? So how how would that be impacted by oxygen utilization in the muscle. Yeah. So that kind of gets into that. There's that classic idea that you have on one hand, a hundred meter sprinter and they're that anaerobic athlete. And then you have that marathoner and they're that aerobic athlete. And they create this, I think it's a false dichotomy between the two things because they're making it seem like they're two different types of athletes or they're using two different energy pathways. But in reality, the only thing that differs between those two individuals is the rate that they're utilizing oxygen because when you take an 100 meter sprinter the second they start sprinting 
they're going to be utilizing oxygen at a very fast rate. And once oxygen bottoms out, or if it does hit 0%, then they're going to hit a wall and they're done. There's no going faster when you run out of oxygen in the muscle. The best you could do is hang on. And when you run out of oxygen in the muscle, that is when you are truly anaerobic. So I think a little bit more of a contemporary idea is that you could, when we say anaerobic, what we're really talking about is the total amount of lactate in the muscle when you're accumulating it faster than you could utilize it. But no one's ever truly anaerobic in the sense that no oxygen is present. Got it. So if we think about, I guess, different energy system utilization as well, right? We can think about the phosphocreatine system or like anaerobic glycolysis or um, like more traditional aerobic metabolism, right? And that those are always occurring in parallel, some sort of like pie chart of which substrate is providing most of the ATP to actually like create movement, right? So if, 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 if that's a good way to frame it, then um, what we're looking at is like, okay, if, if this is occurring, there, there needs to be oxygen present, even if we're still getting a significant portion of the pie chart from these like non-oxygen dependent sources. Is that a good way to think about that? Yeah. So that's a good way to think about it. And even most people are familiar with that traditional energy system chart where it has like on one axis, it's kind of magnitude and the other one is time. And it shows from like zero to 10 seconds. It's like ATP PCR, then it's 10 to 20 seconds. And it's like the anaerobic system that extends out and eventually it just shows aerobic system past two minutes or whatever it is. That model is not inaccurate and that acknowledges some contribution of everything at some point. But instead of having that model extend from like zero to 10 seconds and 10 seconds to 20 and 20 to two minutes and two minutes to an hour, imagine sandwiching that entire thing within a thousandth of a second. And that's the rate that it's occurring. So when we say you're never truly anaerobic. Technically, you could be, but it will be happening for maybe 0.10 seconds. So if we're sandwiching that entire model down, that's why oxygen is always going to be present in the muscle. All of those processes are so tightly intertwined with each other to the extent that if you see O2 or oxygen going down on a MOXIE monitor or another NEARS device, you know PCR or phosphocreatine is going down at the same rate. And if you see oxygen going up, you know PCR is going up at the same rate because their rates of depletion and um, restoration are so tightly coupled to one another. Got it. And, and that's not just a relationship like a dog panting to, to measure the temperature, that the, the restoration of phosphocreatine is actually oxygen dependent as well, correct? Yes. Yeah, so... It is oxygen dependent, and obviously we can't measure phosphocreatine practically right now in like a field testing setting. So these measurements are taken in labs, and that's how the technology is validated. So we're never actually looking at PCRs, coaches, or practitioners. We're just looking at oxygen. But because we know that those are so tightly coupled through um, validation studies and contemporary energy system models like the glycogen shunt model, we could just make inferences about that by looking at oxygen. Got it. So I wanted to ask you as well just about um, some more traditional fatigue models based upon acidosis, et cetera, right? So it sounds like you think that the actual presence of oxygen in the muscle is going to be the limiting factor. What, how, if at all, does that relate to just like acidosis accumulated from working too hard? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so there's going to be a relationship between when you see someone sustaining a very low oxygen environment in the muscle, you know they're going to be in a hypoxic state, and that's when you're going to see the accumulation of hydrogen ions. And one of the things that actually ties into that, one of the ways that we get hydrogen ions out of the muscle is through the bicarbonate buffer systems. That's where CO2 is produced in the muscle. And we could actually make inferences about CO2 levels in the muscle with NEARS as well by looking at the blood flow trends. So we see when athletes are in scenarios where they're forced to sustain low oxygen environments for a long period of time, they have trends showing that they can't get enough CO2 out, which tells us there's going to be a lot of hydrogen ions or acidosis or metabolic stress in the muscle, whatever terminology you want to use for that. Got it. So we sort of see all these things happening at once where oxygen is low, um, CO2 is high, and hydrogen ions are also high. 
And are each of those things independent fatigue mechanisms or are they all just um, related to the lack of oxygen? I think it would be difficult to make a definitive statement about that either way because a, just our understanding of fatigue I feel like is rudimentary enough at this point that I don't know if we could really make like big statements about it either way. Some of the fatigue models that we do know um, correlate directly with the oxygen is when you have a lack of oxygen in the muscle, um, the actin myosin myofilaments are going to lose their sensitivity to calcium ions, which are going to be um, created in like the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's going to cause peripheral fatigue. And we do know that that occurs, but so far as where like hydrogen ions and phosphate and all these things tie into it, I don't know if we have enough evidence to really give us anything definitive with that, particularly in a sport like CrossFit, where you're dealing with peripheral fatigue, central fatigue, glycogen depletion, models of fatigue, speed of contraction. It's just like a sand. Are we allowed to curse on this? You can say whatever you want. Yeah. Totally. Um, so just to, to clarify what you just said about, um, like sensitivity to calcium ions. So, um, quick background in order to actually create a muscular contraction, calcium ions are necessary to sort of like stimulate the, the like literal contraction of the muscle fibers. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, what you're saying then is that, um, in these scenarios, the sensitivity of the muscle cell to calcium is essentially broken. So even if there are calcium ions present, you can't create cre contraction. Is that correct? Exactly. And then that's going to cause peripheral fatigue to occur. So then it's going to kind of go through that central governor model of something is happening on a cellular level. Then we're going to experience it on more of a systemic level or technically more of a localized level because it is peripheral fatigue. And then that's where you're going to see a perception of effort or our sensation of fatigue occurring. And then there's going to be downstream effects of that as well. Yeah. So in, you know, to use like a, a more tangible, like CrossFit example, I think everyone who has done CrossFit, maybe not everyone, since, you know, we'll, we'll probably get into some of these different types of limiters later, but most people have probably had the experience of doing something it's hard, but they feel okay. And then they do a rep that just is like a little bit too hard, quote unquote, where it's like, Ooh, I had to like grind the transition a little more than I expected on that muscle up. Or like, Ooh, I had to kind of like jump to throw that wall ball up or like, Ooh, like locking out that deadlift, like wasn't quite as easy as I thought. I kind of had to like hitch and lean back. And then like, after that, you're just cooked. It's like, you're done. You're done for the day. Right. Um, and so based upon what you're saying, it sounds like we may be experiencing this peripheral fatigue based upon, you know, the, the lack of oxygen saturation, which then creates this, you know, lack of sensitivity to calcium ions, which then creates this compensatory movement pattern where it's like that weird grindy transition or like hitchy deadlift. And then you have that peripheral fatigue, which then sends a signal to the central nervous system, like something's wrong out here. And then we can just get like massive downregulation of everything. Is that a reasonable story to tell? No, yeah, that's that's a really good way to think about it. And one of the things that you had mentioned is like throwing that wall ball and it's like you're grinding through a wall ball and it's it's almost like you're doing a one rep max back squat in a way. And one of the interesting things with this model, this is going to kind of tie in a bunch of different concepts, but let's say you do a one rep max back squat and you use like a high end velocity tracker, like a gym aware. So you actually know your speed at a one rep max squat. And then you do a 5RM, a 10RM, a 20RM, and 30RM, your speed on that last rep, regardless of your rep max, is going to be near identical. Because in effect, it is the same rep happening in all of those scenarios. So when we're talking about this metabolic stress and that fatigue and that peripheral fatigue occurring, one of the things that's going to be a byproduct of that is increased motor unit recruitment. You also get increased motor unit recruitment when you're doing very heavy lifting. So in effect, if you're doing a Metcon and you push like a squat to failure in a Metcon, even if it's at a really light weight, it's going to resemble both from an oxygen conforming response in the muscle, um, the amount of tension in the muscle and the velocity, it's going to in effect be the same thing as doing that heavy squat. So they're really not even that dissimilar scenarios. Yeah, your muscle doesn't care how much weight is on the bar or if it's just a, a wall ball, for example. 
right? If, if it's fatigued enough that you're going to get the same motor recruitment pattern of trying to just like use everything you've got. Yeah, exactly. And it's why if you think about hypertrophy training, like I almost call it like a stupid training adaptation because it's just not specific to anything. You could get it with very light weights to failure. You could get it with very heavy weights to failure. And obviously those are going to have different downstream effects. Like one will get you a lot stronger because there's some neurological adaptations. One of them will help you clear lactate better, but both of them could lead to hypertrophy because essentially what's happening in the muscle fibers is identical, even if the neurological response is different. What about uh, connective tissue response? I would imagine that there's potentially differences in terms of loading or total number of repetitions performed um, on something like, you know, tendon strength or, or bone density or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, if we're going from like a tissue, connective tissue, that kind of model, I think there is going to be a difference between those, um, both with stimulating different parts of the muscle. If we look at like regional anatomy or um, what types of fibers are stimulated, we also have the concept of like fatigue damage, which it's like a weird term to use because it really applies to things like metals and like material science. But it also applies to a muscle too. So different types of loading are going to induce different types of fatigue damage or be protective against fatigue damage. So there are more things to think about. So it's not just like, oh, just go lift heavy and just try a bunch of random shit and it's going to be great. There are these things that you need to think about. Um, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with that. Yeah. Well, I was also just thinking in terms of, you know, if you have someone who's, let's say, a power lifter. Right. Like not only do they have to have the neurological drive to lift um, super heavy weights, but once you get to a certain point, you also kind of have to like even set up your skeleton to be able to tolerate the weights that you are going to be putting on yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so to sort of circle back on the idea about, you know, just the, the way we experience this fatigue. Um, you know, with, within the idea of like muscle endurance, right? Anyone again, who's done some for, sort of training has experienced like a muscle endurance burn type of situation. What do you think is going on when someone is getting like, let's say a burning feeling versus when someone is getting like a pump? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so what I think is happening when someone's getting a muscle pump, and this is just based on what I've seen. So if we think of the types of reactions that you could have in the muscle, we could chunk them into three different things. So we have what's called the compression reaction. And to make it really simple, this is, um, if, imagine you fill a hose with water and you just shut the water off and it's sitting in there and you squeeze the hose, you're gonna squeeze some water out of it when you squeeze the hose and then you let go and you're gonna stop squeezing water out of it because you're not putting pressure on it. That's called the compression reaction. Then you have a venous occlusion reaction this is you squeeze the outside of the hose and you put the water on all the water's pooling in the muscle and building up. That's what a muscle pump is. So when someone gets that pump, they're getting a venous occlusion in the muscle where if we're looking at the heart as that central valve on the hose and say the arm as that hose end, they're creating enough tension in the muscle that their heart can't push through that tension. We have all that blood pooling up. So some athletes get that and that generally is a product of having a cardiac or a delivery limitation. But then you have other athletes who no matter what you give them, they're never going to say like, oh, I was pumped when I failed in that Metcon. They'll either say like my muscle was burning so badly um, or my leg just went dead and it felt numb. So with those athletes, the ones who are getting that really bad burning in the muscle or their muscles just going numb and it's almost like it turns into concrete – they're generally either going to be respiratory limited, which means that they're sustaining a very low oxygen environment in the muscle and they're not able to breathe off enough CO2 and they're getting all of that acidosis and metabolic stress, or they could even have some combination of those two mechanisms that's causing those feelings in the muscle. Got it. So you think the, the actual feeling of burning is potentially related to the, the acidosis within the muscle? Yeah, I think so. And I, I, I'm not even sure if we would classify it strictly as acidosis. I think it is a subjective feeling that we're going to experience as we sustain a low oxygen environment in the muscle and not even bringing acidosis or any of that into the equation. Yeah, got it. And it seems that anecdotally, at least, that people are able to push through burning much more than they're able to push through getting a pump. Do you see that as well? 
Yeah, I think that is generally the case. But part of it, I think, is going to be like a mechanical factor. If you get enough of a venous occlusion or that feeling of a pump, you're quite literally not going to be able to contract the muscle fully because you have so much of that cell swelling. Where with that burning sensation, unless you are literally at 0% oxygen in the muscle, which to be completely honest, most people don't quite push to that point anyway, you could still keep pushing because there is that substrate and the muscle available to you still. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and I think that that speaks to, uh, honestly, just like listening to people who are good at CrossFit talk about it and they say stuff that's like really kind of stupid, but it's just based upon, you know, their, their own experience, right? Cause if you listen to someone who's good and to them, they're like, yeah, you know, I felt like my shoulders were burning and I just decided I wanted it more than the other person. And I just like decided to do two more reps than I was going to. And I just kept pushing and I just, that's how I did it. Right. And to them, like they're, they're not experiencing the same, um, like you're talking about like actual venous occlusion that's creating this pump that's going to prevent them from moving forward, they are able to, in fact, like push through in a way that most other athletes are not. Yeah. And I think most people too, like, this is going to sound like a terrible thing to say, but I really don't think most people's subjective experiences in Metcons are that valid anyway. Because even putting, I've put dozens of people through physiological testing and I'm like, what are you feeling during this? And people are like, I feel fine. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, well, you have almost no, <laughs> no oxygen in the muscle and you're going to fail in about three minutes. And then they fail. And I'm like, why didn't you keep pushing? They're like, I don't know. I just couldn't do it anymore. I'm like, but you weren't feeling anything. They're like, no, I just couldn't hold the wattage. And then you'll have other people where I'm like, what are you feeling RP wise? And they're like, man, I'm at like an 8.5 or a nine. And I'm like, dude, this guy's like another half hour in him before he hits the point of failure on the step test. So I think both people's perceptions aren't always entirely accurate. And I think the higher level someone gets, the more valid their perception of effort and their sensations of fatigue are. But I also think asking people post hoc after they do a test, people create these narratives about what they just did after the fact. And oftentimes, the way that they reframe it after they've completed this thing, even based on their own expectations of how they did is going to frame how they describe it to you. And all the time I'll ask athletes about their pacing after events and all these different things, and we'll talk about a week later, and they tell you two completely different stories. You're like, well, which is the more accurate one? The one that you told me a minute after doing it or a week after when you've had time to process it? So I think it's always that process of like self-narrative and that framing how people describe what their experiences were. And then also it's just not really remembering our experiences entirely because if we are great at remembering things, none of us would ever go and do another Metcon again because it's fucking <laughs> terrible. So instead we remember our remembering of it and we're able to recollect it in a more positive way. Yeah, that's really interesting. And there's also the aspect of when you're creating a narrative – right? That you're essentially, your, your brain is constantly predicting what's going to happen and is relating your current experience to prediction, right? On like a super micro level. So, you know, all the data that's coming in from various sensory input is sort of being filtered through this predictive algorithm where it's like, how close does this match our prediction? And to your point, like elite athletes are probably like more tightly coupled in terms of what's actually happening and what they're experiencing just based upon the, the endless cycles of feedback they've gotten doing that. But that, that still doesn't mean that it's totally accurate. Cause I mean, it's, it's still this kind of like predictive model of like, okay, I should feel like this. I should feel like this. I should be getting these signals. I should be, you know, be able to contract this muscle this hard, whatever. And you know, it's, it's all just kind of a mess that, that gets put together into some sort of narrative that like, who knows how actually real that is. Yeah, and I mean, to your point, like there are studies on elite athletes where they get better performance out of them just by lying to them and changing what they think they're doing, and then they're able to push harder than they'd usually be capable of. So to give you an example of how this would work, you take like trained cyclists and you have them do a time trial on a bike and do like a true all-out time trial, and then you have them do it again and they see a little pacing thing on the screen and they'll tell them this is the pace that you sustained last time and it will really be like four percent faster 
So because they think they've done that already, they're able to keep up with that fake pacing bike on the screen and set these ridiculous PRs that they probably wouldn't have been able to do unless they thought that they've already done it because there's this concept called a hazard score where it takes into account your past experience doing something, your current experience, and the total, your RPE, and the percentage of an event that you have left. So to give you an idea of how this would work, let's say you're the second lap in a mile run, which a mile race is four laps, and your RPE is pretty high, but because you have so much of the event left, you have a very high hazard score and it creates a sensation of fatigue. But then you push and now you're in the third lap and the percentage of the race you have left is a lot lower. And even if your RP is the same, it makes it that you have a lower hazard score. So you experience fatigue differently. This is why someone, even if they're like dying on a four lap mile race, they could kick the last 200 meters and you're like, well, why didn't you just do that 200 meters before that? And they're like, well, I couldn't have done that. Obviously they could have, but our abilities are being governed by all these different factors that we're not able to account for in real time. And lest, uh, lest anyone think that you're engaging in some questionable magical thinking by citing that study, if you make the, the pacer thing a little bit too fast, they just can't do it, right? It's like kind of a narrow band that they can, that they can set those PRs. And do you remember the numbers on that? Yeah, it's like this perfect band of challenge. Like, And I mean, I'm sure most athletes would understand that themselves. Like if they are in a race, like if there's someone, they just start crushing you in a race, like people are eventually going to give up because they realize there's no chance of them actually holding it. But it's like when you have that person that you're racing that's just slightly faster than you, that's what gets you your best performance. Yeah. And you have a track background and that's much more of a thing in things like track and cycling, right? Where like athletes try to play those games with each other and try to break each other mentally with their paces and all that stuff. What was your experience with that as a runner? Oh man. Like we used to do so many like fun things like that to try and like mess up other people's pacing and try and like, because people think like, oh, you're just running around a circle a bunch of times. Like whoever's the fastest wins the race and people don't realize how much strategy there actually is in track and field. And part of it is trying to break other people psychologically. So if you're going around someone's shoulder to pass them, you do things like hold your breath when you're passing them and then keep running. So people hear, because you hear people breathing in races. So if someone's blowing past your shoulder and you don't hear them breathing heavy and you're breathing heavy, then it tells you in your head, like, Oh, this person's fucking crushing me and I'm not even going to try and keep up with them. And then obviously you get around them and then you start like hyperventilating and we would do things like that. Or like you just like, if there's someone that you don't think you could actually get around them, you just run on their heels enough that it just like fucks up their stride mechanics and then they'll let you get around them. Um, when people try and get around you, you could just run in front of them and box them out. Like there's a lot of things that you could do to mess up people's races. And particularly when you're running in races where it's like a dual meet and it's team to team, you could create team strategies where you intentionally box in their faster runners so they can't do well. And you use like some of your slower runners to box them out. So there's a lot of like funny things like that. It's kind of like the inside baseball that most people watching it wouldn't realize what's happening. I love the idea of just running close behind someone to bum them out. It went just walking in downtown Chicago. You get people who kind of do that, who just are walking closely behind you and it seems like they want to go faster than you, but they're not passing you. And you're like, it's so uncomfortable. You're like, what, what are you doing? Like, just get out of here. It's just so upsetting. <laughs> yeah. It's so uncomfortable. And for a sport that's so much about your headspace, when you have someone basically breathing on the back of your neck and not making an attempt to go around you, like that's all you could think about. And that's someone it's happened to me. And all I could think about for Like in indoor track, I ran a 16 lap race and you're like, this dude has been breathing on my neck for the past eight laps. And they're probably just sitting there like not wasting their mental energy thinking about stupid shit like that. Yeah, it's, it's a dirty, it's a dirty trick. So you were the victim of that. Did you ever do it to anyone? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been a victim of it. I've been on both sides of this. So I'm not going to play some like good guy and be like, oh, it's always these assholes messing with me. I mean, that's it's kind of a part of the sport. You just even if you're not doing it intentionally to someone like you might actually just be running a pace that's slightly slower in being an asshole doing that to them. And they probably think you're doing it on purpose. Yeah. It's well, you know, if, if someone's going to do it, the, the entire field's going to, the entire field's going to have to do it as well. It's okay. It's a race to the bottom. Um, so you're talking earlier about these occlusions that get created, right? Like the, the Venus occlusion in a muscle that sort of prevents outflow of blood. I don't know if you actually touched on it, but you've spoken previously about arterial occlusions, which all, which also then prevent, blood flowing into the muscle. And, you know, this just seems like a huge part of creating these fatigue responses in athletes. Can you just go through in a little bit more detail, um, what you think is actually happening and how that actually limits athletes when they do end up with these occlusions? So do you want me to explain like what the difference between an arterial occlusion is as well and kind of how those differ? Yeah, that would be awesome. Okay. So if we were to use that hose analogy again, where that venous occlusion, you're squeezing the out end and water's getting into the hose and pooling up. In arterial occlusion, imagine you just squeeze both ends of a hose, so the water just becomes stagnant in there, and nothing could get in or out of that hose. When that happens, if you think about it logically, if that hose is your muscle, think about it as your quadricep. If no blood could get into your quad or out of your quad, and you continue doing work, there's no oxygen able to get into the muscle, and you can't get waste products out. So you're going to fail very shortly after that happens, where if you have that venous occlusion, sure, you can't get waste products out. You don't have steady blood flow, but you're still getting some oxygen in there and you could kind of keep going for a bit. So like until you basically pump, you can probably keep going if you have like a venous occlusion, but the arterial occlusion is sort of like, all right, you're basically done. Yeah, like an arterial occlusion, like if you get in like a lifting set like that, that's pretty much you're done. In my experience, I've never seen someone push through an arterial occlusion. Like once that occurs, if it's in a lifting set, the set's done. They either fail the rep or they happen to be able to complete that rep towards the top and they rack it or they dump it. If it happens in an endurance test, they generally just have to pull their pace back enough that they no longer have that arterial occlusion because they're not continuing their output with that. Got it. And so then if we think about an athlete, say, doing some sort of CrossFit Metcon, right, and they're starting to hit an occlusion, it, it seems like some athletes are much more prone to this than others, as you mentioned, right? And that the, the actual way that they're going to fatigue is going to depend on whether or not they are, you know, essentially able to keep pumping blood in and out of the muscle, or if they're starting to get this occlusion and then you know, they're going to be impacted more by like the blood pooling in the muscle and the sort of like lack of oxygen delivery based upon that. What, what do you think is the actual difference between these athletes who are limited more by these occlusions and those who are limited more, you know, just by the overall delivery of oxygen to the system since they aren't occluding? Yeah. So the way that I'd kind of frame it is athletes that are delivery limited, they're going to be the ones that get those different kinds of occlusion reactions. And then if we call the other camp a respiratory limited athlete, if we take a snapshot of what's happening inside both of those athletes muscles while they're going, we're going to get two very different pictures. So assuming we're doing CrossFit, one of the things that um, Max L. Hag is my boss at training think tank, if um, people didn't know that. So one of the things that Max used to say, like, five or six years ago. And he wasn't even talking about this kind of concept model at all. He was just saying it as like an offhand observation. We were watching Travis do a Metcon. And he's like, man, Travis turns Metcons into cyclical work. And he just meant it as like Travis keeps moving and he never stops during a Metcon because he's so efficient with his pacing and braking. But that's something that stuck to me because when I started doing physiological testing, what I would see is respiratory limited games athletes turn Metcons into cyclical work quite literally. If you put on a Moxie monitor and you watch them, you couldn't distinguish a mixed Metcon from a cyclical 2K row if they're pushing because you have this nice steady blood flow and a nice linear desaturation of oxygen in the muscle. But then you look at those delivery limited athletes and you're like, man, they could be doing a Metcon or they could be doing like circuits of like lat pull down and close grip bench press and leg press because they're just cutting off so much blood flow to the muscle 
and they're getting like a pump and that pooling and oxygen is going down and up and they have all these crazy chaotic trends. Sure. So I think that that's a pretty insightful way of phrasing it, right? And I think that a lot of people in the CrossFit coaching space or, or competitor space have an understanding that like, you know, these high level athletes are able to make things that seem crazy, like quote unquote aerobic. Right. And I think that, that what you're talking about there is pretty much the actual physiological explanation of what's happening. But I, I guess my question has more to do with say someone is an athlete who tends to occlude. What, what is actually happening for them? Are they just creating more muscular tension? Are they worse at having the, the muscles relax more quickly? Are they, you know, more prone to this desensitization to calcium ions? I mean, it, Maybe we just don't know, but I'm curious if you have a thought about like what the actual difference is. Yeah, so I think in the way that I'm going to answer this is this is my best guess at what's happening based on what we're able to see, but there's always going to be things that we're not able to measure and we can't say for certain. But what I personally think it is, is it's the relationship between their cardiac output and their muscle tension, like you had mentioned so the way that I think about it is delivery limited athletes are too strong relative to what their heart could push against. So if we imagine the muscle like a hose, and let's say you could only put the hose on a set setting, maybe it's pushing out a certain amount of pressure. And if we squeeze down on that hose hard enough, the pressure that the spigot is putting out isn't going to be able to push through that pressure that we're putting on the hose. So you could say that the pressure we're putting on the hose is too high, or you could say that the amount of pressure that the spigot's capable of producing is too low. Either way would technically be an accurate way of describing it. So what I'd say is it's some combination of a mismatch between those two. And that's why for a CrossFit athlete, one of the things that I'll often say to people, particularly when I get athletes on board, like I'll get young dudes who are like 600 pound deadlifters and they have like, a 705 2k and they're like i don't want to get weaker like i want to be a competitive crossfit crossfit athlete and my logic is what's the point of being strong if being strong makes it so you cannot actually be good at your sport because at some point their cardiac output is so insufficient relative to the amount of tension they could develop in the muscle that them being strong is actually their biggest weakness or liability and so if we think about a strong athlete like that, is the issue that they can actually create so much tension or is it the issue that they create that tension indiscriminately? I think it's a little bit of both and it depends on the person. So for example, I had a guy that I put through testing recently um, and basically we had him do five reps at 5% of his 1RM, 10 reps, 15 20, 25, dot, 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 et cetera. I don't need to say every number in 5% increments. People can figure it out. And what we saw is once he got to like 35% of his 1RM and he was like maximally recruiting, he was basically sucking all the oxygen out of his muscle. He didn't need to do that, but he maximally recruits on all of his reps. And one of the things that I see, this was particularly back in the day when a lot of CrossFitters were using a West Side approach and doing a lot of speed strength work is you only want to have maximal rates of contraction when you're good enough at CrossFit that you could just go unbroken on everything anyway. And then the winner is determined by who could move the bar the fastest. But for everyone else, unless they're so slow that that's a liability, maximal contractions on all reps isn't really a good thing. So I think that could be an issue for some of those people. Um, so that would be like the indiscriminate amount of tension. I think another one could be how they've developed that strength and through what routes. So a lot of times these delivery limited athletes that we see in CrossFit at least, and this is probably why we see it more often in male athletes. You look at these guys who maybe they played football growing up or hockey, some kind of speed or power based sport, and then they get into bodybuilding. So they've developed all of their peripheral systems. They have really good mitochondrial and capillary density in the muscle, and they have really good oxygen utilization, but they haven't really done anything to develop the central system, like the heart and the respiratory system. So then they go and do a sport like CrossFit, which outside of very low levels of development, you're not really getting a lot of great cardiac development, or at least on the longer end, what people would call aerobic training. And for those athletes in particular, because they're so good at utilizing oxygen and creating occlusions, 
they basically just turn CrossFit into bodybuilding again, and then they end up kind of screwing themselves where they create a very low ceiling of performance for themselves because they're reinforcing their ability to use oxygen by doing so much Metcon work without ever developing the heart, and then they end up in that very skewed or imbalanced position. I have like seven questions. Let's try to let's try to pick one. So let's say this indiscriminate contractor, right? Going going max effort with a thirty five percent. Is that something that you can teach this person? Just be like, dude, you just gotta calm down. Like, don't try so hard. Like, relax. Don't make weird faces. No grunting. Like, just chill. Is that is that enough to be effective to help with that? My honest answer is going to be I have no fucking idea because I – that honestly, that's something that I've been working on trying to figure out because I've seen it pop up enough now in athletes that I – generally athletes that I do consulting with so I don't have full control over their training. And one of the things that we see is when they're intentionally just trying to go slow, then that's also not great either because they're like, dude, yeah. like, I'm not even moving physically that fast. It's just they're getting maximal contraction when they do move. So it's like, well, if you don't want them to intentionally go like do like a tempoed thruster and just with their natural cadence, they're maximally recruiting. It's like, how do you get them not to maximally recruit when they've trained that way for such a long period of time? I think a carrying more systemic fatigue chronically would probably solve that because they'll get a slower contraction speed. But I don't really think that's a good solution so that is to say, I don't really have a good solution for that right now. If anyone has one, please hit me up. Yeah, I, I agree with you that working with that type of athlete, if you get them to try to slow down like in, in a certain way, it almost makes it worse, right? Because they're like, there's like more time under tension then, and then they're moving in sort of a weird way, which kind of exacerbates the issue. And they feel like they're going slower, so they should be less tired but then there's like a fatigue mismatch, sort of like we were talking about earlier. So it feels harder than they think it should because they're purposely going slow and it just like spirals out of control. And that's one of those things like people hate to hear these kinds of answers, but like this is just going to be the truth. Like I've never seen that with a games or even a high level sanctional athlete. It's usually someone who's like high level intermediate or even like a bubble level sanctional athlete. And for those people, it's like, man maybe that's just how your fibers twitch and that's who you are. And at some point you have to accept like maybe CrossFit's not the perfect sport based on your physiology. Like if you just want to dominate a sport, if you're that explosive and you're getting maximal contractions on everything, I can think of about eight sports that you're better suited <laughs> for than CrossFit. But I think people have this expectation because realistically being an elite CrossFit athlete is a much lower bar than being like, an elite football player, which would obviously be in the NFL. So people almost feel like it should be doable for them. But for those people, it's like, man, if you're just doing this for the love of the game and you want to see as good as you could possibly get, like, fuck yeah, let's keep doing it. And we can make that happen. But if their goal is to be the best in the world and be on the podium, it's like, man, this probably just isn't for you. That's a good point. You know, there, there is, there is sometimes an element of your physiology, just not cooperating. I, I actually think that there's potentially related to that archetype, sort of like a, a hyper mobile muscle bound guy, which is pretty interesting, right? Cause you see these big, big beefers and you're like, man, that guy is so stiff and he potentially is like, he doesn't move well, but if you actually assess him, he's super hyper mobile, right? He has like a ton of joint laxity, so he almost has this like weird protective tension, right? Where it's like someone, I, I think that I got this analogy from James Jousey, where it's like, you're walking across ice and you're afraid to slip. So you're just like so stiff. And so, you know, you, you can see that type of athlete who looks huge, presents with what seems like poor mobility, but has just like crazy range of motion, but can't access it and just sort of like tightens everything down. So they don't just like dislocate all the time. Yeah, and then there's even a third archetype, like the ones that we see that are some of the best CrossFitters, the ones that like look soup and some of the cross like elite athletes that look super jacked, it's because they're fucking crazy stiff. But other ones, um, 
they look like really muscular and you're like, man, they probably carry a lot of tension. And then if they're on a training table, like you'll talk to their massage therapist and like, yeah, they have zero muscle tension in any of their muscle bellies. And you're like, man, that's probably why they're so good at CrossFit because they could ramp it up and access all of that. But then at a baseline, they don't have a lot of muscle tension and that's why they're able to deliver so much blood and oxygen into the muscle. Like even someone like Travis Mayer, where you're like, man, he has really good aerobic capacity. And you're like, he could also clean close to 400 pounds, but he's not really stiff. And same thing with like an athlete like Will Morad, where it's like the dude looks like yoked and it's like, but he is really good cardiac output and he's not limited by delivery at all. Yeah. And I think that that's really interesting as well, where you can sort of see that baseline correlation of more powerful athletes tending to struggle in CrossFit, but it's just not always completely true. Right. And so if we think about it, there probably is a correlation, like you said before, between that ability to maximally, maximally recruit and potentially the issue of maximally recruiting all the time. So there are, there's probably certain types of powerful athletes that really struggle with CrossFit based upon that, but there's other types of powerful athletes that can actually be pretty effective in, in the sport since they just don't recruit as hard except when they need to. Yeah. And I think it's also just like a product of what we call a powerful athlete in the CrossFit world. Like we see a dude who's like deadlifting close to 600 pounds back squatting five and they're a CrossFit athlete. And you're like, man, that dude's like so powerful. And it's like, Ah, put him in a regional powerlifting meet and like those aren't impressive numbers. Like someone that size would be deadlifting high sevens. Um, so like when we look at elite CrossFit athletes and we're like, man, they're really strong, but they have good endurance metrics. So they're really enduring and they have crazy strength metrics. And you're like, but look at them compared to the ends of the spectrum. And you realize that no one at an elite level in CrossFit is a that strong and obviously like I'm one to talk like I'm not a strong dude but if you compare it to the strongest people and no one at the elite level in CrossFit is that enduring like the best CrossFitters at the games level they row maybe a 6.15 to 6.22k I knew people in high school that rode faster than that and those weren't like national level athletes in high school even a mediocre high school track athlete is faster than some of the best games athletes in a mile and a pretty good high school football player might back squat more than some games athletes. So I think if we're looking at it on, on those absolute levels, it's like, yeah, a super powerful CrossFit athlete, they could still have fantastic cardiac output because it's kind of a false dichotomy. Like they're not the most powerful person in the world. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you think that there has to be a trade off between like, let's say power quote unquote and that ability to have um cardiac output and not occlude i think at some point there has to be a compensation where you're gonna have to choose one or the other but i think crossfit has told us that that point is a lot further than we thought it were was so for example in crossfit there are athletes who could snatch 300 pounds and run a five minute flat mile Previously, we probably would have said like that's never going to happen because you can't get super strong or super enduring simultaneously. And you would have maybe said maybe like a 250 snatch and a six minute mile. And it's like, no, that boundary is just further for a lot of people. So I don't think we've necessarily crossed that. Like, I think you will see people with 600 pound deadlifts and sub five minute miles. But I don't think you're going to see an 800 pound deadlifter that could run a five minute mile or a four minute mile or that could deadlift 500 or 600 pounds. So we'll see. The sport is young. So I want to get in the weeds one more time with the, some of the details of the actual measurements that you're taking. Um, so we're essentially measuring this oxygen saturation in the muscle is this something that you're doing on one specific muscle? Or are you able to do this sort of wherever you want? Technically, so depends on the application. If we're doing, ideally, you would have two monitors. You would have one on the primary involved muscle group and then one on a secondary muscle group as a reference point. And that would be really applicable for something like aerobic work. So for example, if say um, a cyclist the main muscle working is going to be like the quads, hamstrings, calves. So we're going to have regional oxygen saturation and blood flow there. You could more or less infer what's happening in any one of those muscles by looking at the surrounding muscles. 
But my delts have nothing to do with what's happening in that activity. So what you'll see is if someone's manifesting a cardiac output issue, they'll start cutting off blood flow to their delts in that non-involved muscle group. So we could get information about the working muscle from a muscle that's not working. How are they cutting off blood flow in that situation? Is it like, does the body just sort of understand where blood needs to go and it just sort of like creates its own occlusions to funnel blood places or what's the So the way that I think about it is at any given point, we need to have enough cardiac output to maintain blood pressure. And obviously we have this thing that's called the hierarchy of critical O2. In order of importance, we want our brain to get oxygen, we want our heart to get oxygen, then our other vital organs, then the working muscles and the non-working muscles. No one has enough cardiac output and blood flow to supply blood to all of those things maximally. So if we're putting on ourselves under intensive work, our heart's going to be challenged to maintain blood flow to that priority muscle group. But other organ systems are going to be of higher importance. So if the heart's coming close to a point of failure and it's not capable of supplying blood flow maximally, one way to continue working is to cut off blood flow to muscles that aren't working. And that's going to be for efficiency and because you're not capable of supplying it everywhere. Athletes that aren't cardiac or delivery limited, they don't have to be as thrifty with their blood flow. So that's one way that you could think of the monitors. If someone is doing something like a CrossFit Metcon, Man, that becomes a little bit more difficult just because the working muscle group is always changing. So in those scenarios, ideal world, I would probably go like vastus lateralis and they're dealt on the opposite side. That'll give you some good data. But then if you're doing work that's like very localized, if I was doing hypertrophy training and I'm trying to like jack up one muscle, then I would just put the muscle, the monitor on that specific muscle group. So depending on what I'm trying to get out of it or what it is that I'm trying to look for on the monitors, that's going to dictate how much I'm going to do it. In the ideal world, we have monitors on every muscle group. A monitor is a thousand bucks though. So it's probably never going to (laughs) happen. Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's super interesting in the sense that, you know, you're talking about these delivery, delivery limited athletes being more um, thrifty with their blood flow. Right. And you, you can see that where if you give them, certain combinations of movements they can do quite well and other combinations just absolutely destroy them right and like burpees in particular are a thing that can just like really mess those athletes up depending on how they're delivered right and that requires you to be shuttling blood all over your body so it's like great we're going to make you occlude by doing you know just a few too many whatever wall balls or something and then we're going to make you get up and down so you have to be pumping blood everywhere and it's just a meltdown Yeah, and with those athletes too, like oftentimes what we see is those athletes have great muscular endurance on a single movement. Like they could rip out a set of like 20 unbroken muscle-ups and then you throw them a Metcon that pairs muscle-ups and squatting and they can't even string together sets of four to five reps and it's because they have that delivery issue and they can't redirect their blood flow. Yeah, that's so interesting. So I was actually asking about the um, placement of the monitor based upon a lot of athletes having like particular muscle groups that seem to be very prone to occlusion, right? Like for myself, kind of no matter what I do, my shoulders blow up, right? Other athletes, it's just always their low back. Other athletes, like you said before, it's always grip. Like, and it, it seems even ridiculous sometimes. We're like, how in the world did your grip blow up on that workout? But it's like, well, I don't know. It just happened. Um, so what, what do you think is happening there for those folks that, that, that creates that propensity for occlusion just like in one specific muscle group, seemingly no matter what is happening? Yes, yeah, so I think like cramping or having tension in one muscle group, there's so many reasons that that could happen. So I don't know if NEARS would even be my first point of investigation for something like that, just based on the reasons. One of the things that you do see when athletes have like that one muscle group that is always the one to blow up or cramp or lock up is it often is a delivery issue but then there's other times where you're like man delivery is fine so it could be something neurological or otherwise yeah that's really interesting so if you if you were like okay we're just going to put this on your forearm because you always have your grip blow up sometimes you will in fact see that muscle, you know, whatever, pooling blood and, um, unable to, to actually like get blood in and out. But other times it's just something different. Yeah, exactly. 
So if we think about the hose analogy that you mentioned earlier, right, where the heart is sort of like pumping blood into this hose, and then an occlusion is a kink that occurs in the hose. In terms of trying to improve an athlete who has this propensity toward occlusion, do we want to think about improving the ability of the heart to pump whatever blood with more force? Or do we want to think about trying to teach that athlete to not create the occlusion or the kink in the hose in the first place? Yes. So the way that I would think about that, because it is that kind of dynamic between the heart and the muscle, we would both want to train the heart to have more like pumping power, but we also want to lower the amount of tension in the muscle. So it's less of an issue. But the way that I think about it is if the issue is getting blood and O2 to the muscle, then we want to improve that, but we also want to make it so the athlete doesn't have to utilize as much oxygen in the muscle or they don't have as much tension. So if you thought about it like this, if you're trying to improve oxygen delivery, it wouldn't make sense to have that athlete doing like a bunch of repeated sprint training and things are to improve oxygen utilization, because that would be like me saying to you, dude, I want you to save a lot of money. So you have to make more money, but I also want you to start spending more money at the same time. And you'd be like, dude, that makes no sense because if I'm making more and spending more, I'm going to end up at the same exact place that I just started. So it's like you have to stop spending so much money and you make more. The making more is improving cardiac output. The spending less is decreasing tension in the muscle and not training things that drive oxygen utilization so much. So I think it has to be some marriage of the two. And whatever that combination is, is going to be relative to the individual. Because if you have someone that they could afford to lose 50 pounds off a max back squat and lose that much muscle tension, then that's fantastic. But sometimes you have athletes who are delivery limited and they're weak. And it's like, well, we need to improve your strength, which is going to drive tension to an extent. But your tension is also too high right now. So then you kind of need to figure out which of those things is more important to prioritize for their performance. Got it. So you think of this idea of, of whatever, reducing the the occlusions, not necessarily in terms of training specifically to avoid that happening, but the overall structure of the training, just driving less tension as a whole. Yeah, I think of it like that. And then in some scenarios, like the thing about CrossFit is because it's such a multifaceted sport, you sometimes have to make some compromises. So you have to do some things that are going to drive tension because you need to do that for the sport. Like personally, I don't necessarily believe in these training models that are more like the traditional blocks where you go from a block of only doing this one thing, then you move to something else. For a CrossFit athlete, I train everything at all times of the year. And I just kind of like tune some dials up and others down and then kind of mess with those ingredients over time. So for a period, it might be maybe tuning the dials down on things that are going to ramp up their tension or drive too much strength or utilization, and then tuning the cardiac output dials up. And then over time, if we get cardiac output where we want it to be, we could tune that dial down and put it on maintenance mode and then start pushing their strength again. And then they end up as a better athlete as a whole. Sure. So thinking about actually driving cardiac output, right? I mean, that that's a little bit complicated in terms of creating scenarios that do that in like a CrossFit scenario, right? Because if you just give these people CrossFit, they're just going to occlude and blow up. And if you just give them cyclical stuff, they're not necessarily going to be whatever in, in an appropriate scenario to actually drive cardiac output. So how do you think about creating protocols that actually train what they need to work on? Yeah. So the way that I think about it is, and I'm glad that you said like the easy aerobic work isn't going to get the job done. Cause I think that's a common misconception that people have like, Oh, cardiac output, just go do long, slow, easy aerobic work. And it's like, ah, uh, yes, but no. So the way that I think about it is we need to create the proper amount of stimulus for the heart, but it also needs to be gradiated. So there's this concept called cardiac lag. If I just go run and go and start running right now, I'm going to start utilizing oxygen, but it's going to take a little while for my heart to catch up and get cardiac output ramped up. And if I'm a delivery limited athlete, in the time that it takes for that to occur, I've already started creating compensation patterns that aren't going to be conducive to my development. So something that I would use for those athletes is doing a very gradual ramping in pace. And this is terrible because we're on an audio podcast so people can't see what I'm doing with my hands, but I'm drawing a very gradual line down indicating that oxygen is going down 
at the same rate that they could push blood into the muscle. So you almost have this inverse relationship that you'd be seeing on a Nier's device. And that's going to indicate that we're able to supply at the rate that our muscle is demanding it. And that's going to maximally stimulate the heart. And we see how far we can push that. And once we can no longer create that nice inverse relationship, the set's done. A way to do this for someone without a Nier's device most athletes have probably done 500 meter row repeats at their 2k pace with maybe two minutes rest for six to 10 sets, whatever. It's like one of those classic workouts that everyone trains. It's a great training protocol and it's really useful. But if you have an athlete that's delivery limited, the second they start rowing at their 2k pace off the bat, they're going to desaturate the muscle and they're going to maintain a low oxygen environment. Another way of doing it is to start the first hundred meters are 10 seconds slower than their 2k pace per 500 meter split. The next 100 meters are 5 seconds slower than their 2k pace. Third 100 meters at 2k pace. Fourth set 100 meters, 5 seconds faster, 10 seconds faster. The average pace for that 500 meter interval will be exactly at their 2k pace. So on paper, you'd think same workout, same response. But that actually allows the heart to gradually ramp up and maximally deliver oxygen to the muscles. So something like that is a more effective training prescription for those delivery limited athletes. So basically what you're trying to do is match supply and demand of oxygen to actual blood flow, right? And by having like a pace gradient, you're, you're able to, to try to match those two variables. And if you don't prescribe with some precision, those athletes are so good at just like very quickly you know, desaturating the muscle, utilizing all the oxygen and then creating this like massive rush of blood, which then occludes them. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly correct. And then over time, you basically want to progress those kinds of protocols into something that more closely resembles the Metcon or sports specific work to try and bridge the gap between those like modified cyclical training sessions and the sport of CrossFit. And you probably have an idea of what tends to create those occlusions for those athletes. So you want to give them something that's like just on the other side of what they can handle then, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's like you're kind of walking the razor's edge between giving them something that's stimulative enough, but not going too far where you're just creating another issue for them. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you spend a lot of time talking about these athletes who tend to occlude because I think it's so interesting. And honestly, you know, anyone who's listening, who's a coach, who's coached a lot of different CrossFit athletes, you've probably seen a lot of weird stuff that kind of doesn't make sense. Like you talked about before, right? Where you're like, you can row a 632K and do 15 to 20 unbroken muscle ups, but you fucking suck at CrossFit. Like what the hell is going on? It's like, oh, it's probably this. Um, But, you know, we we have this other class of people that, don't tend to create these occlusions and are able to just continuously pump blood in and out of the muscle. So for these folks, then, you know, it sounds like they're potentially more limited by something like their VO two max, like their ability to just like take in oxygen as a whole, as an organism. So for these folks, then are these the people who are going to be able to just throw a bunch of endurance intervals in with their CrossFit training and just get better at everything? Yes. So those athletes, they are the ones that could more or less to do whatever they want on the energy system training side and be able to adapt to it. That doesn't mean that that's the best way to do it. It's just that they're not going to see negative repercussions from anything because there aren't many things that are going to exacerbate their limitation for the sport of CrossFit, but they do still need to be a little bit more tactical. So for them, what ends up limiting their performance is diaphragm fatigue. And it sounds ridiculous, like most people don't think like, oh, your diaphragm muscle is going to get tired, but it's not that different than any other muscle, like a bicep or quadricep, and it uses so much energy. So for those athletes that aren't delivery limited at the top of a sport like CrossFit, one of their issues is that that muscle loses a strength and contractility and force output over time, like any other muscle. And that inhibits their ability to actually get oxygen into the body. They can still deliver it just fine because their heart's working, but they're basically delivering deoxygenated blood to the working muscle. And do you see a difference in diaphragm fatigue for people doing something like CrossFit versus doing more cyclical-based stuff? Yes, I think elite athletes in most cyclical sports that would be categorized as like mid distance, maybe like a mile runner or two mile runner, they'll probably be limited by diaphragm fatigue as well. But I think one of the things that makes it 
even more of a prominent limiter in CrossFit is that your diaphragm is also a major spinal stabilizer. So if you're coupling like barbell cycling and bending and all of these things that are forcing you to brace and stabilize your spine and you're breathing really heavy, it's like, man, that's like a one-two punch for your diaphragm and it's just going to make it more prone that that muscle is going to fatigue. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really, really interesting. And then another question on those folks, right? A lot of the times those people are going to be the athletes who may need to get stronger to improve their performance, but based upon their characteristics, it's tough for them to create a bunch of muscular tension, which is necessary to hypertrophy. So what, what do you think about when designing a, a, a protocol to make an athlete who, you know, just can't occlude no matter what they do actually get stronger? So yeah, for those athletes, cause that's exactly what their issue is. It's like, oh, they're gifted with endurance work. And it's like, yeah, but no matter what they do, it's hard to get them strong. So what I found for those athletes I tend to use autoregulation for this, not because I think they have to autoregulate their training. It's because I don't always feel comfortable writing some of the ridiculous strength training sessions they have to do. <laughs> so for example, like, well, I'll, I'll tell you about my own training because I am res very respiratory limited and it makes sense given my track and field background. So for years I would do like traditional strength training protocols. I'd even do them with higher percentages and all these things. And like, it was very difficult to get my numbers up. But then I started playing with different methods of auto-regulating my strength training. Man, I would do a session. It would be like 15 sets of five back squat at 88% of my one rep max. And you'd be like, as a coach, I would never write someone 15 sets of five because that's just about one of the dumbest things I could think of. But training in that way actually drove my numbers up quite a bit to where at one point I was deadlifting close to triple body weight doing these ridiculous volumes and I found for a lot of athletes, generally they're not that extreme because most CrossFit athletes don't come from as extensive endurance training backgrounds. But for athletes that have a lot of trouble gaining strength, it usually takes driving total weekly volume up to a place that they probably weren't training at before. Doing that at intensities that probably seem like they shouldn't make sense for absolute strength training work. Like it's not uncommon to have an athlete that could do a triple or a set of four at maybe 95% of their one rep max or higher in a sport like CrossFit, then also driving their frequency up higher. That being said, the crux is that a lot of athletes can't actually handle enough training volume that they need to drive their numbers up. So to give you a simple example, let's make it like as reductionist as possible in a perfect black or white world. This athlete needs 20 sets of squatting to get their numbers up but they can only do 10 sets of squatting per week before their knees start hurting. Then it's like you basically need to train them for months to be able to handle the amount of volume that they need to get better at what they want to get better at. So it's this concept of like training the trainability. That's really interesting. Yeah. Cause if you, like you said, if you give some of these, these freak CrossFit athletes, all right, you're going to do whatever sets of three, every 90 seconds on your back squat until you hit an RPE of nine. It's like, cool. That's going to take me 90 minutes. Like, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to do this forever. You're like, what, what's wrong with you? Um, but to your point and, and kind of like we were talking about earlier, they may not actually have the structural integrity to be able to handle that volume. Cause even though 90% to them, isn't the same thing as 90% to someone else, like it's still a lot a volume at a relatively high intensity. So they need to be capable of even handling the strength work necessary to drive adaptation. Yeah. And it's one of those things like the time piece is such a shitty part of it. Cause it's like, yeah, most athletes can't afford to spend their entire workout just doing squatting. Like when I was training for CrossFit and trying to be more competitive and it's like, man, just squatting and then doing some bench press would take me like 95 minutes. So for an athlete who requires that level of strength work and they're not a full-time athlete, it's almost one of those things where it's like maybe we just don't get the maximal strength gain because they just can't afford it time-wise. It would almost dictate that they're only doing strength work on some days. And for a CrossFit athlete, it's also not a great scenario. Yeah. And when you create these auto-regulation protocols, is it based upon RPE? Are you just saying, hey, you're going to do sets of this on this interval until it gets X hard? Um, so I do it some different ways. I, one that I'll commonly use is uh, fatigue scale rating. So for example, if I were to write five reps on back squat at 85% effort, rest two minutes, 
times what I would call like fatigue scale rating two, which ironically enough, fatigue scale rating two means leave one set in the tank. They would do five reps at an 85% effort and use a fixed load across all sets, maintain their rest and keep repeating that until they have one set left in the tank. That would be an easy way of just auto-regulating set volume. You could also auto-regulate intraset volumes to the amount of reps that they're doing or intensity, or you could use nears to auto-regulate training as well. Yeah, because you can actually just look and see, okay, have we actually created a scenario where you are having a hard time um, on the muscular level? That's so awesome. Evan, this has been fantastic. A bunch of these questions were things that, you know, watching your videos and reading your articles, I wrote down as like, oh, wow, this makes a lot of sense. Like, what's the deal with this, whatever. Hopefully we were able to also deliver this in a way that was somewhat helpful for people um, too, since I know it can get pretty technical. Um, but you have a bunch of stuff out there on these concepts. Do you have a recommendation for some of those things that people may want to check out if they are interested in digging into this more? Yeah. So if someone were interested in learning more about these things, I would usually point them towards just all the free resources they could go towards first. So I do a lot of writing on Instagram. My handle is literally just Evan, E-V-A-N underscore my last name, P-E-I-K-O-N. And I also have a link tree linked in there with dozens of articles, videos, all free. And I'd probably try and go through all of that because pretty much anything that I would talk about on a plate paid platform is going to be out free in one form or another. There you go. Great. So that's, that's useful stuff. You, you, you decided to move to the more adult, uh, actual name on Instagram. What was that? You, you moved to your, your actual name on Instagram because you're an actual adult now. Oh uh, yeah. It, I don't even, I've had it as so many random things over the years, but yeah, I'm like, now I feel like I need to be somewhat more professional and use an actual name. <laughs> I love it. Um, Cool. Anything else that you want people to, to check out or look into? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if people check out those things and they find it interesting, there's a few free talks that I've given out. I gave one this past week for Moxie Monitor called um, Using Nears to Indiv Individualize and Optimize Hypertrophy Training. That was one that I've put a lot of research into. There's a ton of citations in there, and I think that's probably one of the more interesting projects that I've put out there. So if people enjoyed this, I would definitely check that out. Yeah, I, I have that uh, that webinar replay waiting in my email. Sweet. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Thanks for listening all the way through. I admire your grit, your persistence, and your perseverance. Since you made it, I have a few favors to ask of you. Go ahead and open up the show notes on whatever podcast player you use. In there, you'll find links to all the resources that were mentioned throughout the show. There's also some links there in which you can leave a review or subscribe to the show. And podcasters are always harping on this because this actually makes a difference in terms of the algorithms that recommend podcasts to new people. So if you do that, it helps more people find the show. And if you head over to toddneef.com, you can sign up to receive most of my thoughts and writing, which really only go out to the email list. A lot of it never makes it to the blog or the podcast. So if you like what I have to say and you want to see some of my recommendations and stuff that I've been checking out, go ahead and subscribe to that email newsletter as well.